Square Ball Podcast. Hello, welcome to the show. Brought to you in association with West Yorkshire Electrical. Yes, it is correct. You've passed the first part of the test. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Do you know what they do? Uh-huh. Electrical things. Uh-huh. If it's got wires in it, they will work with it. That's what I've heard. Mm-hmm. That's what I've heard. If you want some way to charge up your electric car, solar panel, battery storage, um, other wiring stuff too. Yep. CCTV, for example, for yep. home or business. Well, I said wires. I think I've covered it. Yep. So I don't have to walk people through all of it, do I? Uh, security alarms, LED lighting, design and installation for business, school contracting as well. Go good, at all, good at all of those things. Yes, go on. And and um, other stuff for your home and business. <laughs> well, like, like finance for the work that they do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they cover the whole of West Yorkshire and beyond. The whole of Yorkshire. You just say you can say the whole of Yorkshire. I was building up to it. Right, and beyond. And beyond. Uh, wyelectrical.co.uk for details or search West Yorkshire Electrical. I'm guiding the listeners with me because they're going, it's not just West Yorkshire. And yeah. I'm saying, yeah, I know. Oh, so it's, you're getting crowd participation. Exactly. It's like call and response. Save us, Phil. Uh, it's the preview version of the... Oh, it's not the Phil Hay Show. Now, is yeah, it? Is it? <laughs> Whatever we're calling this show, it's that. <laughs> with West Yorkshire <laughs> Electrical. If you're on the video, you can see Phil is out of bed this time. Out, yeah. of his, out of his pajamas. If you are, yeah, if you're yeah. just a listener to the show, you, you're missing out on a treat because the start of the week show, Phil, you were effectively in bed, weren't you, under the eaves? Yeah, the, there were reasons for that, which I won't bore people with. Um, but a big game this one on Friday, so I thought I'd get dressed and yeah, get down the living room. Good lad, good lad, well done. Uh, yeah, and it is a big one, isn't it? Previewing Leicester then as we head in towards the weekend. Uh, biggest game of the season, obvious question. Most difficult game of the season, anyway. Most difficult, yeah. It's hard to say if it's biggest game of the season because it, it. So thinking about when the season wraps up, how much you're going to look at this particular fixture and think it was influential or, or massively dictated anything. Um, I think if Leeds are in any way going to stay in touch with Leicester, and I'm not even sure we can say at the moment that they are in touch with Leicester, they they've got to win this game. They certainly can't afford to lose it. Otherwise, the gap is going to stretch to such an extent that. First of all, you'll be saying that it's highly unlikely that Leeds are going to catch um, Leicester by the end of the season, but also more and more looking like Leicester are just going to canter away with the title, um, which, to be quite honest, I think they probably will anyway. I think being on a borderline on 40 points at this stage of the season um, makes it nigh on inconceivable that you, you won't finish top two or at least be right on the, the tails of whoever does. Um, but we said on the, the Monday show that Ipswich feel like they're far more there um, to put pressure on at the moment. And that, as much as anything, is why Leeds kind of need a result from this. Ipswich got a game in hand, which is a way at Rotherham, they'll think is, is pretty winnable. If that gap starts to stretch significantly, then you sort of feel that moving into the winter, you're already starting to think that it probably is the playoffs um, more than anything else. So that's the, that, that at the moment, I think, is the gap that you need to worry about. Ip- Ipswich facing a tough task against um, Wayne Rooney's Birmingham this weekend. I stared down yeah, the camera. Yeah, he started incredibly well just to justify the, the sacking of, of John Eustace there. Um, and as I said, Rotherham to come after that. Without any doubt, this is Leeds' most difficult game. Um, but uh, taking out the Southampton fixture, which was obviously difficult in its own right, they've caught with some hard games. Um, Norwich away wasn't easy. Ipswich away, not easy either. Um, good results, at, very good results at, at both of those. But Leicester just seem to be on a different level to me. They've done exactly what you want to do when you get relegated, which is get into your rhythm really quickly and make the best of of the better players that you have because they tend to be better than what is elsewhere in the championship. Um, Get results on the board. And as I say, their position couldn't be better. It is record-breaking territory for them. Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, we are recording ahead of the press conference, so we don't know if there's going to be any injury update just yet or any new injuries come up or whatever. But... um... Standing as we are ahead of that, Joe Rodon feels like the absolute cornerstone of this to me about any potential success um, at the Walkers. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, Farker said after the um, after the win over Huddersfield that it was a slight hamstring issue for him. Um, I said at the time that he was quietly confident that Rodon would be fit for Leicester, although wasn't committing too heavily to that. The difficulty with hamstring strain, as opposed to you know just like an impact injury and knock or whatever else, is that. You can't really play through it if it's not right. Um, it will need to be right in order for Rodon to be in the team, and it doesn't give him a huge amount of time to to recover. I mean, Farker certainly wasn't ruling him out at that point, um, but they won't be able to risk him 
if his hamstring is in, in any way a concern. Because if it, it you know, if, if a minor problem becomes more serious, then you start to talk about extended period of weeks where you're missing. Uh, and I think, as we saw in the second half against Huddersfield and the difference when Rodon went off, he simply isn't a player that Leeds can afford to lose at this stage. But I'm with you. I mean, I think him being in the team is going to be is going to be absolutely crucial when it comes to how it goes for Leeds down at Leicester. Um, in part because, you know, Leicester's defensive record means that you don't expect Leeds to score a huge number down there. Um, although I think Leeds attack will probably put as much pressure on that defence as, as anybody else this season. Um, but also Leicester are scoring goals and they're scoring pretty freely. And you do need your best back four in that. And he, he to my mind, as much as I think Strike has, has really settled this season in a way that he needed to, I think Rodon is the player who in that back four has made the real, the, you know, the biggest difference. Yeah, they've only conceded eight goals. They've scored 29 of Leicester as it stands up there. So a pretty formidable, yeah, I, pretty formidable I, record. I was picking through the, the um, expected goals against just to see, because that defensive record's really striking, like you say, eight goals, just to see how, how it actually stacked up against what they should have conceded. And they at the moment, they're on, um, going by the, the numbers and the stats, should have conceded around 12. Um, Leeds at the moment, second behind them in, in terms of the best defensive performance statistically they should have conceded 13 and, and have conceded 15 so slight disparity each way um with with both clubs um but i think you know whether or not leicester were bang on the money with their, their xg against 12 goals conceded um from the number of games they've played is still really really impressive they, they just look very very good at both ends of the pitch and i think more to the point um, a little bit like Leeds with with Farker, they've just settled into Maresca's style and, and to his um, his strategy and his, his way of working. It seems like a really, really good fit, that one. Crescenzio Somerville's birthday this week, talking about Rodon being a crucial cornerstone in this side. What about Somerville as well? Because he's a possible doubt for, for Friday. He was just um, carrying a little bit of something, wasn't he? Yeah, he's had this shoulder injury. Farker was saying after um, the Stoke game, the reason he hadn't started in that was because there was a bit of pain um, in the shoulder that he was having to take painkillers just to get through some of these games, I would have thought that a week will be long enough for him to be ready. And I do think to an extent that the game on Saturday kind of crystallised the the idea of what Farker's best to live in is or, or something pretty close to Farker's best to live in. I think some of it has to be in that. Absolutely think Dan James has to be in that as well. I don't think you're making many changes, if any, to that starting lineup. Um, from um, from Saturday, I'm not even sure you would bring Archie Archie Gray back in um, in place of Shackleton at right back, but that's probably the the biggest of the calls there. Um, but Rodon, like you say, is the one really. Unless there's been anything new developing through the week, he's the player that really needs to be on the pitch, and he'll be the player that that Fark is most concerned about. Did you see the photos of Crescencio Somerville's birthday? I don't know what filter it was, or I think it might be an Instagram. It was on, but it was a picture of Spence and Somerville in the middle with Ruta on one side of him. And it looked like the best album cover you've seen. You know, just occasionally you can get a photo <laughs> of a group of lads together and you go, that looks like an, an album cover. And it really is worth looking up. It looks really, really cool. But uh, I don't think he went to the Netherlands this time, which is probably for the best that he's not travelling back and forth. I think they went to the Ivy, whether it be in London or the one in Leeds. Yeah, it seems sensible. That was funny, actually, with his birthday last year. Well, it was it was said by Marsh that he hadn't gone to Holland, and then it turned out there were loads of photos of him with Dutch cars driving driving behind him. And he just seems to have knuckled down massively. Somerville, you go back over the past couple of years, there's always been a little bit of chat about his um, his attitude. Marsh used to talk a lot about how Nonto was a very positive attitude, a positive influence on Somerville, almost implying that Somerville needed that kind of guidance and, and straight line around him just to to keep him keep him on the straight and narrow. Um, but it looks like Somerville and Fark have clicked in, in quite a big way to this point. As I say, I'd, I'd absolutely be, be playing him on Friday night. Go, going through Leicester's team, you've got a lot of players who've had big influence so far. Um, Dewsbury Hall seems to be having the best season he's he's had for them. But Somerville is kind of in that in that vogue and, and in that form at the moment where it is goals, it is assists. He is making a, a huge difference. And that, I think, I mean, Leeds have to be very tight defensively. That's for probably the first port of call. But those are the players that Fark is going to have to, you know, rely on Shane and some of them, Ruta, you know, um, Dan James, because you will need to score at Leicester um, to get something out of the game. I don't doubt that they will find a way through this Leeds defence at some point. How do you approach this one then, do you think, from a Leeds point of view? Not necessarily fans' point of view. I mean, in terms of the team, do we go out there and attack in the same way that we have tried to against other sides? Will they let us, do you think? It's a good question. I don't think they will especially let Leeds do that. And, and there's part of me feeling like it wouldn't be entirely a bad thing if Leeds were to be slightly more cautious 
um, or to not take huge risks initially, perhaps until the game starts to open up. But having said that, the real strength in Farkas' team is that attacking line. You know, that is what, what's doing the damage for them. That is what's gathering the points. That's what, when when games do become open, that other teams are really struggling to cope with. And maybe that's how Farka has to cross his fingers that, that it goes, that it is fairly close, it is fairly cagey or, or tight for an hour. But then when it gets into that period of the game where it does become a bit more open um, and, and a few more risks are taken, then players like Somerville, Ruta and others um, make that situation pay off for them. I think from Leicester's point of view, that there's not an awful lot of point in them being hugely defensive or hugely negative. I think they're in a position where they can afford to go for gold in this fixture and, and they can afford defeats at this point. They can afford to drop points because of how many they've they've got on the board at the moment. Um, I wouldn't put this down in any way as a, a must-win game for Leeds, but I think it's a game that they definitely want to take something from. I feel like psychologically, as much as we probably can't catch Leicester at this stage because they're so far ahead, if we can get something here, I think it gives us the incentive to think, but theoretically we could. We are as we are maybe as good as them or we, we've got the possibility of doing it. And in doing so, I guess you then push yourself nearer to Ipswich all the time as well, don't you? Whereas it feels like if we go here and get turned over 2-0 or something, you probably just go, oh, okay playoffs as best we can hope for then fine and we maybe we settle end up settling for that so i think i think it is still important to try and get something here even if it's maybe not actually that important to the season as a whole yeah it's interesting how you kind of stage the next part of the season isn't it yeah yeah mm. like from a psychological point of view because i don't know how, how do you feel about this like because i i don't worry about this fixture and i feel like it could go anyway i've no idea what's going to happen here it, it's a total crapshoot um but i'm looking forward to it I don't go into games oh, yeah. fearing them now, like in the sense that, you know, you go into games in the Premier League, you think, well, we're not going to beat Man City. So kind of, all right, I'll 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 turn up and watch and, you know, pray for a miracle or whatever. Um, and I say that fully aware that we got that win at the Etihad when Stuart Dallas scored. But, you know, generally speaking, you go into those games hoping for a miracle. These ones you don't, do you? You think there's a chance in every single oh. game. And even as difficult as the Leicester game might be, you hope that our counter-attacking strength maybe could cause them a few problems. Yeah, I think the one thing I liked about the Premier League was going into games and players on, on your opposition lineups that you actually wanted to watch, you know, players that you're interested to see. And I think there's an element of that with Leicester. In the same way as I think for Leicester, there's an element of that with, with Leeds, with players particularly like Rooter and, and Somerville um, and a, a couple of others. Um, Ipswich feel like the conversation at the moment more than Leicester. Um, I think Michael's right as well. The, the impact of a good result at Leicester is that you you get it in tips which is head that leads aren't going away. You know that they are still there, and it does just psychologically, as you mentioned, Dan, like put it, put a little bit of pressure on there. It just keeps you it keeps you honest in it, and it keeps you alive to to what's going on behind you. Um, I think as it stands at the moment, there definitely is that risk that if Leeds hit a, a kind of fallow period of form, um, even if a few weeks of, of results not coming, the Ipswich do get away from them, um, and you suddenly have a top two that look almost impossible to catch or, or very, very difficult to catch. But it would be, it'd be a statement result, definitely, um, winning at Leicester. And I think Southampton was just an odd game all round. Never got started Leeds. I think they did miss Rodon in that, um, which is why I'm very much hoping he'll be he'll be fit for Friday night. Um, but it just seemed sluggish and it just seemed totally contrary to, to so many of the games either side of it where Leeds had, had played really well. But if I think about Ipswich and I think about Norwich, you know, it wasn't as if they were great for 90 minutes through either of those games, but they just had it when it mattered. Um, and they were able to force the issue and those were those were big results in, in their own right. Um, so another one on Friday would, would yeah, it would be major. With all the talk of chasing down the top two, are we completely taking the playoffs for granted? Because we're only in there by <laughs> a couple of points as it stands. And I know it feels a bit like the division has now taken shape, particularly with the top four. And I think having seen West Brom and Cardiff, who were also in there and Hull just below, kind of go, well, we are better than them, I'm pretty sure. So, is the playoffs a done deal, Phil? Do you think we can not drop out? I mean, you've got you. <laughs> what, what nailed on? Is he nailed, nailed on? on? Is that the I, phrase you used? I, I don't think. Um, I don't think anybody's particularly being complacent about that. I think it's more the the question of are Leeds going to be relegated into a situation where that's all there is to play for, you know, and that's all there is to go for realistically from from quite an early stage. Which I think Farkas' team at the best are better than that. Um, and there would have been seasons previously where it wouldn't have developed. The, the shape of the table wouldn't look as it does now. You know, we obviously saw it with Burnley running away with it in the way that Leicester did. But you have had seasons where it's been very tight for second place, and and it could be could be yet. I mean, the, the playoff picture is quite fascinating because it is incredibly tight as it always tends to be. Um, and even you know, 
forgetting about the top two for a second, even if Leeds can get some breathing space between themselves and, and seventh place, it will help. It just helps you to tick over, helps you to maintain some rhythm. It, it does does ease the pressure off. Um, so, no, I, I wouldn't be complacent about the playoffs, but I think Leeds are easily good enough to get into them. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's where you position yourself, isn't it? And given yeah. the, the, you can look at the resources we've got, and the performances that we're putting in and say, we should be in there. And if we're not, then something's a bit wrong. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I, at the start of the season, we did those predictions and I went for sixth with Leeds, which was maybe underplaying it slightly. Um, but I was very conscious of how the summer had been and the lack of you know, ideal preparation time for Farker, which I think really told in, in the first month of the season. But it has started to kick in. And I think, I think you do sway from the mindset of, you know, this is not ideal, this is tricky it's, it's challenging for a head coach to looking at the squad and, and the players who are in it and thinking well he should be doing good things with this squad it's not to say he should be winning the title not to say he should be finishing second but they should absolutely be in the running um because he does have that level of quality he does that have that superior level of quality in players like Ruta in particular but others through the team Ampadu rode on I think we get into most sides in this division um without breaking sweat and on that basis you should definitely be in the mix yeah you're talking about Burnley um, 25 points from 14 games. They were top with that total last season. So it goes to show you how the division is just skewed a little bit, doesn't it? And you look at how weak the bottom end of the Premier League is and you think, God, this side that we're putting out now in the Championship would probably stay up in the Premier League if we were up there this season. But, you know, we made our bed and we have to line it, I suppose. I think it would on the basis of the teams who are in the, the bottom three at the moment. Um, but I was I was listening to um, Five Live and they were chatting about the, you know, um, the teams had gone up, the teams had, had gone down. Um, so something similar to, to what Michael was saying um, on the previous podcast about the fact that in Leicester and Southampton and also to a degree Leeds, you had teams who who had tried to invest. So actually were dropping into the championship with um, you know a bit of money um, or at least players who were, were worth a bit of money. And I, I think if, for the sake of argument, those three clubs were to go back up and you know Southampton, a bit of ground to make up at this stage, but do have a really good squad down there. I think the division... Premier League becomes far more difficult than it is this season. I think there'll be some sides who get away with it in the Premier League on the basis that the bottom three are incredibly poor. Although you could say that that was the same last season because I think there was a good argument to say that a team like Everton could have justifiably gone um, last season and had very little complaint about it. I was going to say, there's always a team get away, getting away with it and it's always Everton. <laughs> <laughs> well, Phil was, say, Phil was saying there about maybe naming an unchanged side. Would you roll unchanged or would you put Archie Gray back in maybe at right back? I'd go unchanged again. Right. And I think, because I quite like the idea of being able to bring Gray on as well as, a, as an attacking option central midfield, because I don't know, with what we've seen of Gruev, I wouldn't fancy necessarily bringing him on unless it's to show things up defensively. Whereas I think if maybe it's not working after an hour, you can bring, maybe look to bring Gray in for Kamara, for example, and try and freshen things up there. Yeah. Phil? It's, yeah, you, it's, you... Always, it's, hard, it's always quite a hard um, decision on the basis that disparity between Leicester and Huddersfield is huge. Um, so in no way are you talking about the same standard or same level of opposition. And I think that's where you have to be wary of thinking that, I mean, to give you an example, I think Pirro will have to be far more involved on Friday than he was against Huddersfield for Leeds to get a result. I don't think he can be quite as peripheral as he was on Saturday um, and, and Leeds play well. And I think likewise with Shackle, and you have to kind of take a fairly sober decision about whether he, because I, I thought on Saturday he looked as steady at right back as, as Archie Gray did against Bristol City. But I think Bristol City had a better side than Huddersfield. So you, you might actually say that, that Gray's performance was was superior. And you just need to be careful that you don't read too much into, into that Shackleton display. But all the same, having played like that and having looked that steady, um, I do think it would make sense to go with the same 11 if, if Rodon is fit. Just talking about the have-nots, we were on about that, weren't we, in the uh, the early part of the week show, the haves and the have-nots. The ones at the bottom, Sheffield Wednesday, um, on, it was Tuesday, wasn't it? Tuesday morning, the story emerged of Chancery asking the fans to pay a £2 million uh, HMRC tax bill. Yes, uh, I can see that happen, can't you? Yeah, because he's very, very popular with them at the minute, isn't he? He I is, think. yeah. yeah. He's, and he's, he's, he's constantly... Exactly what everybody will... Exactly what everybody will want to do is pay hundred quid to cope for uh, deal with the club's mismanagement. Yeah. If everyone wants to give me a hundred pounds as well, mm. <laughs> if everybody who listens, to, for it. if everybody who listens to this show gave me hundred pounds, then we'll then you guys can pay off your massive tax bill. We'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll maybe split it. <laughs> yeah, fifty pound each. Set up. A, we'll set up a PayPal. Phil's got enough anyway. He's fine. Yeah, you've seen you've seen the way Phil lives his life. He's but, got the word billionaire on his jumper as we as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Yeah, you can find these on YouTube, by the way, if you are, if you are just listening. And if you're watching on YouTube and you don't can't stand the sight of us, you can find us in your, in your podcast app as well. But yeah, they're not having a very nice time of it out of the Sheffield Wednesday at the minute. And while we're a game. Well, while we're all happy to laugh at the um at the misfortune of others, which is basically what football's about, uh, it's pretty bad, isn't it, that uh, it's, it's just reminiscent of our bad old days just gurgling around the bottom of the, this division and then going into League One and stuff and just when it all goes wrong from an ownership point of view just how grim and miserable it is and they aren't, they're not happy I mean they did try to, to go up at certain points what the, what you've seen with Sheffield Wednesday and I guess Reading in League One are teams there have overspent whereas we didn't really overspend we just had I suppose you could argue the, the year we reached the playoff final on debates we overspent but until from that point onwards, we basically were just doing it on the cheap, weren't we? It was our our issue. So at least Sheffield Wednesday had a playoff final. That was fun for him. You'll remember when Leeds went into administration, they had a tax bill of about £7.7 7 million, pounds, if memory serves me right. And I'm, I'm trying to imagine what the reaction would have been had Bates come out and said, well, what we really need is 500 quid from each fan. And if we do that, we can pay it off and, and it's all fine. And the same with, you know, I don't know, like GFH or Chilino saying, you give me your money and we'll deal with, despite all the season tickets that you buy and the merchandise and everything else, and we'll get rid of this tax bill that really it was the club's job to manage. It had gone down really well. What would that have sounded like? <laughs> you want Premier League football? I'm going to pay my money. Call them Sigpots, can we? <laughs> Thank you. Um, just on that, like... I get the rest that people want to give me extra money. Mm-hmm. And that's what people are going to do. <laughs> Sorry? That's what people are going to do. <laughs> yes. Astro and Crato. They said they want me to stay in charge. <laughs> oh, job. happy memories. <laughs> One so, penny in a pound. <laughs> there were some really confused Americans who've, who've, who've started following Leeds United more recently wondering what's going on there. Listen to Ken Bates. It was... Former owner Ken Bates, yeah. It was actually made less sense than that, for yeah. the most part. Yes. Um, it's weird, I was just thinking about that. I've been reflecting on like my relationship towards the championship as a whole... And I've realised I've, I've kind of been in a form of denial about the championship. I feel like, and it's wrong of me to do this, and it feels terribly arrogant and entitled and, and Premier League-y, but I can't, I'm viewing the championship as like, well, this is just a place that we're temporarily staying. You've got to be careful not to fall into that trap, haven't you? You do a little bit, but it has to be said that the championship is set up more and more like that. Um, a division that clubs come down into, and even if they've been poorly managed, and even if they're a bit of a, State, which Leeds absolutely were at the end of last season. You know, you can't pretend that in any way the framework was ideally there at the end of May um, for them to to get promoted. But you, your income is just so vast in the Premier League that it, you know, there's there's no way of team. And this is why. And I think um, I think Angus Kinnear spoke to you about this during that that long interview you had with him. This is why there's such opposition and growing opposition to parachute payments um, in the Championship because. Other clubs are, are saying, clubs who don't have them and, and are never going to get them until they go up into the Premier League, um, are saying it's just becoming impossible to compete with because you, you come down and Leicester have Ian Acho and they have Ndidi, who I think Ndidi's going to miss Friday's game, which is a, a he's a big player for them. And, and I think that will make a difference. Um, but, you know, it's the same at Leeds that you're able to carry. And OK, there, there were wage reductions at Leeds, but even so, you know, you're carrying Ruta and you're able to then sign Perot and Ampadu and and others, um, it, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that a lot of clubs who come down are going to go back up and are just passing through for the, the odd season here or there. But the danger comes if you get stuck for two or more seasons, then, you know, you start to feel the pinch, parachute payments dry up, and suddenly you're in the other boat where you're trying to compete with sides who are coming down and are, are far wealthier than you. Well, I won't ask you for a prediction for Friday's game. Uh, I always, you know, remain on the side of optimism, but I genuinely, like, as I said before, I've got no idea how this one goes at all. Plan for the worst, hope for the best is how I feel about it. Yeah, I think Head is saying Leicester, um, but it, it's got the potential to be a crazy game, I think. Yeah. Um, one to watch then, Phil, the, the topic player thing issue we should be looking out for in this game? Piro, for me, I think Piro needs a big game. I mean, obviously, Rodon, that goes without saying, and if Rodon isn't in the team, then you're looking at how the defence is affected by that, because it did look shakier, minus him against Huddersfield. Um, but I do think in that 10 role, Pirro is going to have to be, he's going to have to be a big presence. He's going to have to be effective um, to make sure that, that Leeds have the amount of attacking play that they that they need. 
quite apart from the um, the stupid time for kicking off on football, a Friday night fixture means that Leeds United have the capacity to either ruin or make your whole weekend quite early in the weekend. I think you can also forget about it, though, soon enough. It almost falls into midweek games. I feel like by the time the weekend comes, you can go, oh, that's happened now. That's yeah. all out of the way. All done. Well, enjoy the game and enjoy the rest of the half-term holiday, which is why Phil is um, broadcasting remotely with us um, with us today. And then schools go back. We'll be back Monday to uh, to pour over the bones of what happened. Then at, uh, I still want to call it Filbert Street in my mind. So <laughs> growing up in like the 90s, Leicester equates to Filbert Street, not the Chris Bowl. It's just around the corner of Pilbara Street from, from where they are now. We used to park there. I don't know if we still are um, this time round, but long gone, I'm afraid. Yes, like many things, um, time never stands still, does it? We will reconvene on Monday, Phil. We'll have a chat about the game, see if we were right, and uh, hopefully we're celebrating a Piro hat-trick. See you after the weekend. See you later. The Square Ball Podcast. 